thank you all for coming and thank you to the Heyman Center for putting this together and thank you all for braving the rain um, we decided to um, make this quite casual Hisham didn't want to didn't want us to plan this out so he doesn't know what I'm going to ask him there's virtue in that I guess for him less for me um, Hisham has been with us at Barnard since the beginning of term he's been teaching a course for us in the English department on exile and estrangement and he's also been promoting his new novel Anatomy of a Disappearance which is his second novel following the um, Booker Prize shortlisted novel uh, In a Country of Men so he's been uh, exhausted this term traveling the country up and down talking to people about his work but also about contemporary affairs in the Arab world it's been very volatile and very interesting in the Arab world and, and for good reasons usually it's interesting for bad reasons but it's been very interesting for good reasons um, um, so the Heyman Center was very kind in putting this together and allowing us a chance to speak more informally and also allowing us to ask Hisham more directly about his own work uh, aesthetically and also possibly at the end maybe uh, about the political situation in the Arab world in general maybe maybe even if we dare to get there about Libya but let's see how, how things go um, the format is basically I'm just gonna ask him three questions and then I'm gonna open it up for questions and comments um, from the audience so the first question maybe ought to be <coughs> slightly general uh, and about both novels both in the country of men and anatomy of a disappearance in both novels the main protagonist uh, is a boy and both novels are in a stance stories of maturation, of growing up in times of severe political repression, in times of dictatorship. So the obvious question initially for me was, why does uh, Hisham Matar find this period artistically so productive for him? He keeps on returning to the period of childhood. What's so compelling creatively about childhood for him? I ask because it's a it's a peculiar kind of period where one is not fully a social agent one is not fully um, responsible as it were one is not fully one is more shaped by circumstances than actively shaping events and maybe possibly one is actually freer because of that so the first question would be what is at stake in in returning to the time of childhood for you. Maybe if we can begin with that. Um, well, good evening and um, um, thank you for, for being here and thank you to the Heyman Center and uh, most of all, thank you to Bashir. Uh, well, I, um, I'm not at all suggesting that the state of childhood is a pure state or is, um, but if you are interested um, as I am in the novel charting social and historical process um, and being about that but also doing it through the private moment uh, not doing it through big abstract landscapes of um, social interaction uh, then childhood is a very interesting vehicle in both of my books, the protagonists are actually adults who are reflecting on very particular uh, moments of their childhood. And, and in the country of men, it's actually a very specific summer, one, one uh, summer uh, when the protagonist was nine years old. Um, and the motive for that, it seemed to me from, from him, uh, that his motive is, is almost to sort of try to repair the rupture that happens when uh, one is removed from a place mm. at a time. And so it seemed to me that what he was trying to do is almost to exorcise the past, 
to return through narrative. Um, and he does it in such a way that uh, sometimes it seems uh, completely illogical. For example, he, he, he spends quite a great deal of emotional uh, and psychological effort in uh, seeing whether he could actually go beyond the point uh, that he's recollecting, beyond that summer, to an even previous past where he could fix history, where he could save uh, his mother. Um, from the from the marriage that then uh, he's a, a product of, so it seems to me a kind of uh, a process of, almost of self annihilation on his part. Um, whereas in Anatomy of a Disappearance, uh, an adult who's reflecting on different moments, starting from early childhood, going all the way up to to manhood, um, and uh, so what they share is that they're both characters that live very much; they're rooted in the past. Mm -hmm. um, so their expression of root rootedness comes, you know, is, is, is their desire to, to return to the past, to try to figure it out. Uh, and so they're haunted by it uh, in, in, in some way. Um, but also, it seems to me that childhood is um, so volatile and so incredibly intense. Uh, everything in it is new and surprising and also um, infinite in some sense. In, in, in other words, it seems perfectly reasonable why a child would uh, break down in tantrums when their toy breaks. That it is the only toy. There's no other toy. You know? um, and so reality seems to be very intense and focused. And, uh, and one's relationship to it is very focused. Um, and, and so on some level, it's almost like a mystical state, I feel. Um, and so there's a relationship in my mind, between childhood and between the act of writing itself, mm -hmm. which is about trying to be in the in the, in the moment uh, itself and not, you know, uh, running ahead of yourself. So those are some of the reasons why I think in these two books, I'm, I'm you know, I find that appealing. There's a there's a kind of moral seriousness about remembering mm -hmm. childhood, um, which was fascinating in, in both novels. It's not a leisurely remembrance mm. of the past. There's, a, mm. there's, a, there's, in a sense, a weight mm. to the remembrance. There's something that the boy is trying to get at, trying to figure out. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I think, um, I think that's true. And I think um, one of the reasons that's the case is because I am trying to almost run against the current of these people's history. And the current is about abstracting that experience. It's about abstracting the, the private moment, the personal moment, mm -hmm. and about also retarding it. You know, so you know you 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 don't uh, you can't co you know um, you're not really allowed the private moment mm -hmm. as freely. And I think it's part of the political project uh, of dictatorship, is to interfere into the private moment, but also to retard uh, the individual and. Um, either into fear or into being so erratic and so incredibly upset that they you know, don't make much sense. And so it seems to me uh, an interesting um, uh, endeavor artistically to try to, to pause on the private moment and to be incredibly um, attentive to it. Uh, and that quiet, uh, concentrated attention that I think you're referring to is on some level um, a very personal rebellion on, on, on behalf of these characters, uh, or, or, or at least the protagonist, you know. Which is why it seemed um, an interesting tool to have them, uh, both of them, be only, only children. That, mm -hmm. um, you know, we forget that, you know, or at least I forget that, you know, some of the most lasting, longest human relations that we're, we're mo most likely to have are with our siblings that our parents leave and our lovers come later on and so on. And, um, and so it seems that um, life with a sibling has a, you know, or life uh, lived uh, with a sibling in the world, even a sibling that we might have many differences with or don't get on with or don't even see, that uh, subconsciously uh, there is an echo of our own existence with uh, um, and having these characters be only uh, children seem to heighten this sense of um, 
isolation, but also the sense of focus that I'm trying to get at. Uh, is it a period you'd expect, it's a very hard question to ask creatively, but is it a period you'd expect to return to in writing? Or is it one you feel that you've said pretty much what you wanted to say about childhood and about the private domestic sphere and about pushing against the pressures of a dictatorship mm. that tries to come into the home, mm. impose on, mm. the p on the individual? Mm. I don't know. All I know is that I am very interested in the family. I'm mm. interested in it as a, as a mechanism um, and how it seems to... I can't think of any other human mechanism that uh, involves such conflicting tides of longing, mm -hmm. you know, longing to get away, but also the longing to be. It seems like in a, in a, in a very good school for being a human being. You know? um, and it's deeply imperfect. Uh, in, in that way, it's a bit like democracy. <laughs> it's deeply imperfect, but it's sort of the best system, uh, it seems to me, for, for, for social organization. I don't know what other system there is uh, that, that is better than it. And one of the things that excites me about it is is literature in general. It's literature that has made me interested, one of the things that's made me interested in, in families. I mean, what would Shakespeare be without family? In some way, you could say Shakespeare is writing about this and this and this, but also in another reading, he is writing about families. And he understood that uh, one of the most um, powerful things about families is that um, they forever impose on us the obligation to get on with people that otherwise we have very little in common with. You know? And uh, it's not just getting on, but we have very deep emotional ties to them. And we associate our own mortality uh, with them. So the father stands between the son mm -hmm. and uh, death. And uh, the older son stands between the younger son and death. You know, this um, is, is, it seems to me a very real um, circumstance of families. Um, so I know I'm interested in families. I am um, perhaps because of my own experience, but I'd like to think it's more than that. I'm also interested in power, and I'm interested in how mm -hmm. power um, engages with human life, tries to, to, uh, to alter it, to manipulate it, and how it then filters through all of these little, small engagements. That uh, I am, in other words, interested in doing the opposite to abstracting power, mm -hmm. you know, making it uh, real. And uh, in these engagements between these people, uh, power is forever playing a role. That uh, betrayal then does become a method of getting on in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, all, it's, it's interesting to me, at least, how in, in sort of the, the, the uh, at least in the Muslim tradition, but I think also in the Christian tradition and in the Judaic tradition, there is this idea that suffering makes you a finer human being, makes you generous, makes you, you know, ignobles the heart. Redemptive. You know? Yeah. And, it, that's possible. I mean, w when it happens, it's incredibly moving and beautiful uh, to witness. But m more times than not, uh, suffering and oppression actually makes otherwise very decent people do terrible things. Um, and at least, uh, particularly in the country of men, is interested in that. The distortions of the private sphere. Yes, and yeah. how people um, how people try to survive with these things, and, and more interestingly, how the how the beauty in them and all these other, f as a shorthand, decent attributes about continue to survive even through the corruptions. Mm -hmm. um, that nothing is ever one thing or the other. That, mm -hmm. uh, that, um, and so you know, one, of, one of the things that, for example, I'm interested in, in writing about what life is like under such a situation. I'm not particularly interested in, at least in the country of men, I wasn't particularly setting out to write about Libya or about Libyan politics. Mm -hmm. What I was interested in, one of the things I was interested in, is how do people um, express themselves under the situation? How do they continue to love? How do they, you know, how does, how does one person touch another person's cheek under the situation? Mm -hmm. uh, how do they listen to music? How do they cook a meal? Uh, and in these very private acts, uh, I'm interested in them not only because I think my sensibility is interested in them, but I think because, in a way, it is an act of resistance in the sense that I am trying to pull back that moment from a reality that was fixed on annihilating it and, 
and uh, distorting it. So to carve out the space for the individual, individual desires, individual relationships within severely oppressive conditions? Y yeah, to carve is not the right word, though, because that space exists already. I mean, right. These things I'm not um, uh, imposing on the characters. I think people do these things, continue to do these things. But it hasn't been the attention. Right. Because something about uh, that sort of reality, a uh, very aggressive political reality, um, prefers men and women of action. Mm -hmm. you know, it prefers uh, people who like to walk around with, with you know, a giant erection. Through, through life, you know, and mm -hmm. saying this is what I'm going to do, this is what's going to happen next, this is, what, you know, and um, and they steal the narrative. That's what most people speak about. Very few people stop and say, uh, yes, but uh, you know, how do you? What sort of stories do you tell your child at night? Mm -hmm. How does how has this reality affected the way you prune your tree? Mm -hmm. That to me seems much more interesting and also much less, um, it, it, it seems to promise uh, uh, a way out of the trap that exists for a writer like me, which is that you become somebody that brings news from another place. That's your function. You know? right. <laughs> um, and I'm not, I'm, not a, that's, uh, I, I'm interested in more than that. And most writers writing from places like Libya, I would argue, in, in, at least in, in America and in in uh, Britain, which, which I know better, maybe I'm wrong about America, but uh, you know, we are read as writers that that bring news. We are mm. you know, we are rarely engaged with as as writers who are interested in human life, mm. and universality. So, um, so it, it seems the private moment is a very humble, <coughs> but actually quite a powerful mechanism. Uh, so that's okay. The second question is tied into this dimension of, of, of power and, and, and oppression and uh, trying to work it through or, or, or see how it works through the private sphere. It's about something that's constitutive, a constitutive feature to both the novels. Yeah. Um, and both novels have it in common. Um, and one phrase that could describe it is that the burden of history. Mm. There's a deep sense in both novels that, that history weighs heavily. Yes. On, on, on the protagonists. The weight of the past is, in that sense, immense. Yeah. Um, in the country uh, of men, the protagonist is burdened by it, even mm -hmm. to such an extent, as you mentioned before, that he sets himself a fairly impossible task of trying to save his mother from her own past injuries and from her own past humiliations, which is a way of setting oneself up to fail, in a sense. Mm. Um, maybe we can speak about that a little bit, and maybe the best way, for me at least, <laughs> yeah. to engage this question is to look at something that Marx said about the past, and this mm -hmm. is a quote for you, so, and I'll read it out for the audience, and it comes from the 18th premiere of Louis Bonaparte, and it is about history, and it is about the weight of the past, and he said, men make their own history, it's a very famous quote, but they do not make it just as they please, mm -hmm. they do not make it under circumstances chosen by themselves, but under circumstances directly encountered, given, and transmitted from the past. Mm. And the operative <laughs> sentence that maybe you could focus on is, the tradition of all the dead generations weighs like a nightmare on the brain of the living. Yes. <coughs> I wonder what you would say about that. Is that an accurate description or preoccupation in, in your novels? Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm, not, I'm a terrible reader of my own novels, but uh, it's definitely a pre it, it, it definitely um, rings very true, and immediately reminds me of uh, this conversation I was having with a South African friend about shame. Is it appropriate to live with shame, uh, or, or shall we buy into the new idea that you know the new generation is born clean, washed mm -hmm. from history? Um, and uh, I am uh, I am particularly interested in shame. You know, I do think it's a very appropriate mm -hmm. condition, actually, um, even for generations after the generation that perpetrated the whatever the crime is. That in shame lies a kind of very sincere, 
and um, passionate engagement with history um, that seems to promise much more than just a, you know, a redemptive relationship to time. Mm -hmm. So, so that's yeah. I thought of that when I when you were reading. So that you mean by shame that the sins of the past cannot be yeah. rectified. That one is feels completely troubled and, and caught by the past, yet there's very little one can do about it, or shame that these things happen to individuals one knows and one... Shame in the sense that, um, that the past um, places on us an obliga a moral obligation um, with our own selves and our own present. Um, I don't mean shame in the sort of wallowing, passive, you know, beating, you know, uh, oneself. She asked style. She asked style. No, I mean shame in the sense of uh, being uh, scarred by the past. It seems an appropriate reality to me. Mm -hmm. Because the opposite is quite frightening to me. Mm -hmm. um, um, what is the opposite? Well, the opposite is to be born in a reality uh, and um, pretending that you've started from zero, that there is no historical process, that the land you live on or the people that you know or the, um, is, uh, has been uh, redeemed by time is a, a, a problematic uh, proposition to me. So self-invention but without a historical perspective? Uh, yes. American style? Everything begins in you? There's a it's Sense a very amnesia. attractive hypnotic idea. It's right. hypnotic, you know. It's a, it's incredible. You land in a you know you land in a different place and you could reinvent yourself. It's very interesting, <laughs> but I don't think it's um, I don't think it's appropriate uh, okay. historically. I don't think it's appropriate, and um, and I think it can cause a great deal of suffering and, and pain. Is it something in general, or something about the fact that? The last or maybe, sorry, but maybe not just, the question isn't just about suffering and pain, actually. The question is about authenticity, I think. I think the thing that interests me about shame is a sense of an authentic engagement with the past. Okay, and you see that as more generalized in the region because of the history of the Arab world? You, do you see other writers in, in, in other parts of the world that have less um, preoccupations with the past, that feel more, that, that, that feel a sense of weightlessness? as it were, in relation to the past? Maybe it's easier to mention a writer who, who I think is uh, attentive to shame. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I think James Kretzia, the South African writer, is very attentive to shame. Mm -hmm. um, and he writes about shame, I think, in a way that's very, very interesting, um, engages with it in a very interesting way. Okay. Um, the last question and maybe we'll use the question for you to read something mm. from anatomy. <laughs> mm. um, it's about anatomy. Um, I, I detect a new openness in anatomy that didn't, wasn't given enough time maybe or the interest wasn't there in the previous novel, in the first novel, in The Country of Men. And it's a kind of a, an opening to, the, to a social world. Mm that's new, not just a political world of public events mm -hmm. and happenings mm -hmm. and those, as you said, as mediated by the private sphere, not just that, but an, uh, an opening to the social world of, of class mm -hmm. and to a world of, of social subordination in a sense. This seems to me mm -hmm. new in anatomy and runs through the whole novel, it's mm -hmm. not just an occurrence. And it stays in the novel mainly because of the figure of, of the servant, Naima, in, mm. in anatomy. You spend a lot of time telling her story, you spend the whole chapter mm. uh, uh, excavating her past and um, um, examining her connection to the main protagonist. Uh, you, d um, you take the reader into the alleyways yes. of Kyrian yeah. poverty yeah. and wretchedness in ways in which in a country that wasn't maybe possible you also, and, and the protagonist as well, you connect to her through very specific kinds of forms. Sympathy is a big word. Mm. Uh, tenderness, these are mm. reoccurring themes. Mm. Mm. Um, people are not, uh, or, or many of uh, the protagonists, they're not heartless. They're mm. constantly trying to feel the position of, of another person, be compassionate. Mm. 
towards it. Uh, both these values seem to me, tenderness, sympathy, as being incredibly effective in the novel. Mm. Um, and yet, something troubling happens at the end, after the protagonist in Anatomy discovers that Naima is actually his real mother. Um, and there's, a, in a sense, what could be described as a, as a refusal to transcend sympathy, um, self-consciously, and a declared refusal, a refusal to turn it into something else, maybe into public recognition of the relationship. And you write, and I'll, I'll quote um, from the novel, you say, and this is part of that encounter when he comes back to Cairo and sees Naim after a very long absence, etc. Um, you say, it seemed that we were each slowly returning to the chain of our private thoughts. What I knew and preferred that I did not know could not be uttered. It was impossible to change our shared history, to be mother and son in the clear light of day. And this was not a hindrance, this impossibility, more, you say, a mercy. Mm. This is slightly troubling for me. And I was thinking maybe if you'd like to spend some time on this. Uh, in the sense in which one interpretation could be that class, in this perspective, could trump family that class is much more effective than the family connection, which refuses to be recognized publicly. Um, so a part of me was, in a sense, delighted that there's this new social opening in the novel of class encounter that Naima represents throughout this novel, especially in an Arab novel uh, in English uh, that comes out of a certain, if you like to put it rather crud crudely, of an elite formation, right? thinking back on on those kinds of questions in the English language implies certain kinds of social goods that most people in the Arab world, as it were, don't have. And yet another part felt that Naima's presence and her voice was slightly too curtailed in the novel. It's there, it's yeah. present, slightly too restricted. Yeah. Um, am I right in thinking that, and maybe we could connect this up to the Arab revolts in a way, that Naima's voice will play a more prominent role in the English novel in Arabic in the future, that as a result of the Arab mobilizations, maybe what the Arab revolts tell us is that the exploited and the subordinated can no longer be presumed absent anymore. They are there, they are battling, they are putting their demands across, not only politically, but also maybe in the novel, in literature, and in Arabic literature in English. Do you see that as a future possibility? <laughs> it's very difficult for me to say. I just uh, very difficult for me to say because um, I can't see my work as part of something else, uh, part of other works, whether it's Arabic literature in English or you know, and it's and and therefore what role it might be playing. I. I am behind it in the sense that you know my my position is actually quite modest vis-a-vis -vis my work mm -hmm. in the sense that I don't have a lot of choices about what I'm doing, um, and I am somehow I feel that uh, that's an important place to be that I need to not have too many choices, mainly because I don't trust my own my own uh, ability to govern it. You know, I would like it to be the way it is. Um, so I, um, I'm always in situations like this when I'm offered such an intelligent and insightful reading of something in a novel that I, that I wrote. I feel, um, I feel a bit like, uh, you know, when you're walking down the street and you just glimpse a reflection of yourself and um, your reaction is, is um, suspicious because you think it's someone else. And then suddenly you realize it's you. And there's that, in that, that moment, there's this gap that opens up between you and the reflection. No? And um, I feel that with, 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 uh, in moments like this, uh, that there's this gap. Um, and I feel terribly unauthoritative over the work, even though I'm the author. No? Um, um, so I don't know, but uh, what I, you know, that particular passage that you, you read and that particular uh, aspect of the relationship between Naima and, and Nuri, the protagonist, um, 
I think hints a bit about what we were saying earlier about shame. Mm -hmm. um, that what Nuri um, is content with, and it's actually, to me, an incredibly um, audacious and brave thing to do. He's content with enduring the history of this relationship and not pretending that they could navigate <coughs> into another space. And it seems that's maybe a, that's, that's a, that's an, it seems that's, uh, that's okay for a moment, because we only know mm. them up to this stage. We have no idea what happened to these people afterwards. <laughs> but, uh, Hence you know, the question. It's the question, <laughs> so I, you know, yeah. Do you think that something else might transpire? No idea, I mean, everything I know is what's in the You tend to describe it mystically, um, this yeah. process of creating, as if something descends on you, or, or, or are the driving forces just internal? There's but no part, worldliness to it? it? No, there's both. No, there's both. There's, um, it's not totally up in the air, but it's not totally on the ground either. Um, and also, a lot of your ability, or my, my ability in trying to, 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 to um, put um, um, a kind of sense and structure to what I'm doing, um, a lot of the time seems a kind of exactly a way to bypass the process, you know? to trick myself out of it. So what I've learned is that all I need to do uh, as a writer is be in the, in the sentence itself. And I, this is the way I write. I mean, I write, you know, I write a sentence, and then I write the next sentence. I don't know what's going to don't. I haven't planned. I didn't know that she's mm -hmm. uh, his mother until about halfway through the book. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and I trust this process. Maybe I shouldn't. But I do, and I feel that um, all of my problems occur when I leave that space. Um, so in a way, one of the things I fear about thinking too consciously about what I'm doing, I do think very carefully, but thinking too consciously about what I'm doing is creating a distance between me and the work hmm. and writing the sort of novel that I don't like to read sort of novel where I could hear the author thinking, you know. Um, I want to r write a novel that I like to read, a novel where I feel, where I could hear the writer risking, where I can hear that, where it is a process of, uh, of putting yourself in a state of absolute freedom, but also a state of absolute vulnerability, um, and seeing what happens, you know. Um, so that's partly why I am, I am cautious about n knowing exactly what's going on. In other words, I have absolutely no idea what's going on. You know, I don't. I don't. I, I really don't. I, um, um, so when I say, yes, it's not completely up in the air, not completely on the ground, <laughs> one of the things I mean, I suppose, is that there are moments when I'm reading through the whole thing and trying to make it into a structure that works, um, that, is, that, 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 that is pleasing, you know, uh, and that is interesting to me. Uh, without finding words for those attributes necessarily, but I feel it in, almost in my body. And there are moments, and they're very rare, when, this, when, the, when, the, when the writing seems to almost run ahead of me. It only lasts for a couple of minutes. When I've written a paragraph that I never thought I'd be able to write. I never even knew it was in me to write. And so therefore, it's very tempting to think it's come from somewhere else. That I am somehow... Um, in service, mm -hmm. that uh, and I do feel that actually as I'm writing, that I am in service, that I'm serving the book, and the book is separate from me. You know, um, it's very difficult to put words on these things because suddenly you know, it all sounds really. Um, I don't want you to jinx it in any way by, by, by no, stating but it. But no, but also uh, wha my my other uh, concern uh, is that I feel that I come across as uh, evasive, deliberately evasive. I'm not trying to, to um, you know, I, I'm genuinely interested in what is going on, um, but I am not, um, but I'm careful not to know. I really don't want to know. What do you mean, you don't want to know? I, I don't know what is going on when I'm sitting when down to write a novel, yeah. I, I, I think it's, it's um, part of the fun is not knowing for me. Is that a way of being authentic to yourself as a writer? You're Maybe, maybe, maybe. I don't Protecting know. Protecting yourself? Yeah. I mean, the whole thing seems incredibly 
uh, fragile and incredibly uh, ambiguous that uh, and also resilient um, at, at once and 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 I am I, I am satisfied with it with it I don't seek to change it if anything my discontentments are all to do with my own inabilities to to uh, you know when things aren't going well they're not going bec well because I'm not able to surrender to it mm -hmm. and I feel it I feel it again in my body I feel myself holding you know being being uh, anxious when the writing is not going well um, and I feel uh, absolutely free and absolutely vulnerable when it's going well okay yeah do you want to? I do. Yeah. I actually. I want to. S do you mind if sure. I? I want to read a, a passage, just when we were talking earlier about in the country of men and about the private moment and how people are in some way corrupted by power or or pressured uh, by it and how at the same moment when somebody is trying to 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 give in to power, they're also retaining something of themselves in it. Uh, of worth in, in the moment. Um, that visit has remained with me ever since. Whenever I am faced with someone who holds the strings of my fate, an immigration officer, a professor, I can feel the distant reverberations from that day, my inauguration into the dark art of submission. Perhaps this is why I often find a shameful pleasure in submitting to authority. Even in prayer, bowing down, my forehead pressed against the ground, my back arching beneath its own weight, my chest falling between my shoulders, my hands flat against the ground, fingers pressed tightly together, hearing my own whispered prayers, I am often overcome with regret and, yes, shame, that I am gloating in it, enjoying my own deprecation. And this is also why, when I finally think I have gained the pleasure of authority, a sense of self-loathing rises to clasp me by the throat. I have always been able to imagine being unjustifiably hated. Ustad Jafar, like most government officials, kept us waiting. We sat in the reception room where the face of the guide, another name for Qaddafi, stared down at us from a photograph that was much smaller than the one Musa hung in our house. The room was done up in the color of the revolution, the walls pale green, the furniture upholstered in a darker green fabric, still covered in plastic, so that when you squirmed, it made the sound of a fart, and you had to squirm again to prove that you hadn't actually farted. A small coffee table stood in the middle where it couldn't be easily reached. On it there was an empty ashtray and a tissue box with one pink tissue shooting out of it, closely followed by a yellow one. The curtains were drawn, they were also green, and a weak light burnt in a small chandelier above the coffee table. A huge television stood in one corner. It was perhaps as large as my piano. Mama sat upright, her knees touching, her hands wrestling with one another. Each time the blood rushed back, into one she would rub it out again. Umm Mas'ud walked in and sat beside her. He's coming, she said. Mama looked at her and nodded. Why trouble yourself with the cake, Umm Mas'ud said. It's nothing, Mama said. We are neighbors, Umm Mas'ud started, but then to my astonishment, Mama began to cry. Umm Mas'ud didn't seem surprised. She must be used to this, I thought. In fact, I have been thinking, saying to Jafar, she went on, why doesn't she come when she knows we can help? I know we haven't always been, always seen eye to eye, but she leaned forward the coffee table and plucked the pink tissue. I wanted to, Mama said, taking the tissue from Mama Saud's swollen fingers. Never hesitate, we are sisters. I swear to God, Mama said, I have always liked you her eyes wide open, eager to convince. Don't worry, Umm Mas'ud said lazily. Her confidence was repulsive. Men are like that. They like adventure. The guide knows this, and he is very forgiving. Really? Yes, Umm Mas'ud reassured her, then lowering her voice to a whisper, added, let me tell you this. 
Once a man was fixed on killing him. Really? Mama said, assuming disbelief. Yes, what can you say? Mad. His mind had left him. When he was caught, the guide sat with him and asked, Why did you want to kill me, my son? They say the man melted like ice and fire, weeping for forgiveness, and the guide forgave him, there and then. Mama looked astonished, hopeful, ridiculously naive. Um Mas'ud plucked the yellow tissue and handed it to Mama. I don't mean to brag, but Jafar has a special place in the guide's heart. And Jafar is, of course, heart and soul devoted to him. Yes, after all, isn't all of this good fortune we are in, she said, opening her hands towards the ceiling, because of his generosity? It wouldn't be right to bite the hand that feeds you. Of course, Mama said, adding in the way people do at weddings, may God nurture the goodwill and keep the envious at bay. From your mouth to God's ear, Um Masoud said. Ustad Jafar rarely stood chatting with any of the neighbors. He wasn't unfriendly, but kept conversations to a minimum, and always assumed the air of the sort of man I would later come to recognize, one who wanted to make the burden of his monumental responsibilities clear. That he was a man who was thrust by fate's benevolent hand into the vortex of his time. He greeted people with a sort of inverted modesty that seemed designed to make them feel humble. He was always dressed in a suit and tie, his hair blow-dried and parted to carefully conceal the receding line. He wore gold-rimmed sunglasses, which he rarely took off when shaking hands with others. He didn't have to seem outwardly eager to prove his loyalty. He was a senior member of the Mukhabarat, trained in Moscow by the KGB, concerned with the larger picture, with the mechanics of security, calculating who was to remain in front of the sun and who to be fixed firmly behind it. Most of us children were led to fear him. Most of us secretly admired his power in comparison with our own parents. Not one of us didn't want to be in his shoes. He walked into his reception room where Mama and I sat waiting like patients at a doctor's surgery. Mama stood up, I didn't. He came straight to me, ruffled my hair and said simply, Suleiman. I stood up, my eyes on Mama, hoping to deflect his gaze. How are you? Answer your uncle, Mama said. I faced the floor and mumbled, I'm fine, Ustad Jafar. This made him clap his hands and laugh. He finally turned to Mama. He shook her hand without looking at her face, repeating, sit down, sit down. Najwa has come especially to talk to you, Jafar, Um Mas'ud said in an un unnecessarily loud voice, a smile lurking on her face. She is our dear neighbor. The Prophet taught us to love our neighbors. Of course, of course, Ustad Jafar said benevolently. Thank you, Mama said and repeated her statement. I swear, I have always liked you, adding that Mas'ud and Ali are like my own. I swear, there is no difference between them and Suleiman. Then, to my horror, she began crying again. Um Mas'ud looked at her husband and pursed her lips. She seemed genuinely to feel for Mama. Go and make us tea, he said quietly, and Um Mas'ud left the room. His tone changed when he addressed his wife. It was rough and unrestrained. I swear to you, Bu Mas'ud, Mama said, these days are pure hell. He didn't ask what she meant. He seemed to know, seemed to know everything. He's innocent. If he has done anything, it's because he was urged by others. Bu Suleiman has always been devoted. He isn't the type. It's just that other people, may God forgive them, have been whispering in his ears. He shouldn't have listened. I know, I know, she said. But what can you say? The devil is mischievous. Then with renewed hope, Mama said, I swear, since we found out about Rashid, we have had nothing to do with him or his family. She began to weep again. Please, Ustad, you must believe me. There, there, he said so softly that I felt a strange urge to hug him. God is great capable of all things. And that was all he said. God is great and capable of all things. Thank you. Can I open up the questions or comments from the audience? 
Okay. Do you want to use the mic or? Um, I am a fan of your work, read both novels. I think they're beautifully written. Uh, I was particularly interested in what you talked about. Uh, how are you interested in the family as a subject mm. for your writing? I found both novels are much more about the relationship between the boy and the father than mm. the boy and the mother. I wonder if that is a conscious decision and if that was a conscious choice. That would be one question. And the other question is, uh, when you were answering Bashir's last question about the role of the lower class in your novels, you said, I have no choice. And I was just intrigued by what do you mean by that? What do you mean by, it seems like you feel you have a, I just wondered you yeah, to ex sure. expand a little bit sure, on what sure. you mean by that. Um, well, you. I think of, thank you for the questions. I think uh, for in The Country of Men, I do think is more about the mother. I mean, I think the, the character of the mother is central and the relationship between them is, is incredibly um, central to the book. But um, yes, I am interested in fathers and sons um, because I think when you write about fathers and sons, you're actually not only writing about fathers and sons, it seems to me, but you're writing about conflicting readings of reality and of history and of the future. And also a kind of intimacy that seems to, the deeper it becomes, the more mystery it seems to create, uh, or the most, more mysterious that the people become to one another. In the sense that it is impossible to know one's father, just as it is impossible to really know one's son. Know them as an equal, as a, um, and that relationship seems very exciting. These are just some of the reasons that now come to, 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 to mind. There are others. Um, and your other question um, about not having choice, I want to be uh, specific about that. Um, this is a subject, in fact, Bashir and I spoke about it um, uh, previously. It's a, to me, it's a very important question, which is, what is the role of the artist uh, if you come from a place like Libya or a place like um, Palestine or a place like Egypt? or a place like Tunisia. What, what, what is the role of the artist? And I am, of course, incredibly reluctant to prescribe it because we have always been told <laughs> what the role of the artist is. And so we are all very sensitive about anybody telling us anything. And I, I do feel uh, very strongly that no one should be telling us how to do things. But I'm, asking, I'm saying it in how I, I ask it of myself, I suppose. Um, what, is, what, what, is, what is there to be done here? And, um, and my instinct uh, says um, that actually trying to edit my work um, in response to some sort of moral or political or historical idea uh, is, would be the death of my work. OK, so therefore, what do I do? My feeling is that it. I, I do feel that as long as I am attentive to reality, as long as I am living as authentically and as deeply as, as I can without ruining myself, because there are risks in living that way. Um, in other words, paying too much attention is a real problem, I think. Um, um, and my protagonists pay a great deal of attention. It's one of their problems um, um, in these two books. But to do that, and to trust that whatever I write is going to have an echo of these things. So I write from a very, I, I try to be as generous and as trusting to myself as a writer, to, this, to the writer self. Um, so the political self or this, this, the, my, the, let's call him the, 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 the civilian, no, the civilian and the artist. So the civilian uh, really should really stay out of the way of the artist. His only role is to be, tender and generous and, and, uh, and uh, quiet um, and to trust. So, um, so that, that's, a, that's what I mean by trust. Um, um, yeah. Mary. Yeah. Um, Hello, two Mary. things. I just wonder if you see that the artist has two heads. One is the subject head and one is the formal head. Mm. And it seems to me that the, the head that you ought to leave to the unconscious is the subject head. 
and the formal head is the one that always has to be controlling and paying attention. And so there's, there's a real um, difference between the porosity that is required if you're, if you're not going to be pushing the subject. And that kind of porosity doesn't work when you have to actually control the language. Mm, mm. So you have to almost be doing two different things as an artist. Mm. And I wonder if you think about that. The other thing I was thinking about when you, when you talked about the, the difference between the political artist and, and the artist who's listening to some other non-socially constructed, I was thinking of Virginia Woolf and that her, her novels, except for Mrs. Dalloway, which I think is a great war novel, really are not very politically engaged. And then she writes A Room of One's Own and Three Guineas, in which she really does talk about uh, the oppression of class and sexism. I and mean, she's one of the first people to say, in 1936, she says that the private familial oppression of the patriarchy is a mirror for fascism. But mm. she doesn't she doesn't try to do them in the same work. Mm, mm. She really um, attends to both her duties in a different way. Um, and I wonder if you thought that was, that was a possibility. Yeah. And, and third, I was thinking about um, writers who use the private or the familial to, ex to expose a larger reality. And I was thinking that the prejudice against that is a male prejudice. And you, I think, deliberately used the phallic image of the mm. big erection. Mm. And I think it's, it's because so much pressure has been put on novelists that if you write about the private and the familial, you are being a girl. Um, mm. But I was thinking of great writers who had used the private and the familial, like Krista Wolf, whom I know you and I yeah. both yeah. admire in Patterns of Childhood, um, Marguerite Duras, Nadine yeah. Gordimer. And I think one of the anxieties against that is a kind of phallic anxiety that if you're focusing on the familial, you're not really doing the big story. So those are just three things I wonder if you could respond Gosh, to. Gosh, um, I, I don't really, I'm not, you know, um, how can I say this without it sounding, um, I mean, I'm not, ver I'm, not, I'm not very sophisticated uh, in the sense that I, I I don't know. Um, what I know is um, that I, I never start writing a novel. At least with these two, it sounds like I've written many. Just these two. Uh, uh, I don't. I haven't started writing these. Sitting down, thinking, okay, right. So what am I going to write about? Uh, shall I say something about this or that? It starts with something incredibly vague and very fragile, and I have to feel like it's about to snap. It's about to break. And it could be an image or a sentence or even just a feeling. In fact, Anatomy of a Disappearance started with a feeling. I had a, f I have a, had a very deep feeling for Nuri al-Alfi. I, I, I knew what it would be like sitting next to him. I, I still don't know how he looks like. But I, I knew what it would be like to be in his presence. Um, and, um, and I was incredibly curious about him because I knew very little else apart from that. And that's what started me writing. And um, after a year of trying to find access into that, um, I hit upon a sentence that made sense, um, a sentence that sounded like uh, a key into the book. Um, and it is still the first sentence of the book. Um, there are times when my father's absence is as heavy as a child sitting on my chest. And I thought, that's it. it. Why did I think that's it? And I felt it in my belly, you know, but um, uh, if I am to, to try to articulate it, I, you know, it had in it the, the music of his, of his thinking. But also more importantly, it had in it his silence. After I wrote that sentence, the quality of the silence seemed different. And I'm interested in that. In that. So, so I am a technician, really. I'm not, that's what I mean by I'm not a, uh, that sophisticated. I stick to the sentence. I stick to trying to write silence, which I'm very interested in. And I build on it. Um, whenever this other voice comes that thinks, that wants to, to, to uh, dictate and 
formalize the thing and say this is what it's about, I kick them out. You know, I, I kick that voice out. I distrust it, um, and I want to stay in that in that space. Maybe 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 it's maybe it's wrong. Maybe it's indulgent. But I, I that's what I that's what I um, that's what I trust, and that's where it feels um, most exciting for me. Um, well, that in a way sort of um, expands on what uh, the previous question, in the sense that because of the way I write, I don't really have a choice, um, which is why it's very inappropriate for me or anyone else to tell me this is this is the book that you should write next. And I say that sometimes to myself. You know, you should write a book like this. That's what you should. <laughs> but you don't write the books that you want to write. You write the books that you can write. The books that you you know, and and uh, and so I. Uh, I don't know, but I, I know that I'm thinking about something right now that that is um, yeah anyway I'm not gonna speak about it it is what it is but um, but um, Libya is um, um, Libya to a writer is like a mountain you know because it's uh, it's um, a lot of it is not written and uh, for a reason for a very good reason uh, we have many writers but they were treated very badly and so. Um, uh, so it seems an exciting time, I think, for a Libyan writer, but also m m more broadly, and I think not only as an Arabic writer, but as a as a human being. It's fantastically, um, it's a very, in for a novelist, the world we live in right now is very exciting. Maybe it's always been, but it seems incredibly exciting right now. Um, if you're interested in these things, if you're interested in social and historical processes, if you're interested in human relations, and, and yeah. Thank you so much uh, to both of you. That was a very interesting discussion. I have a question that's a bit, it's not articulated in my own head yet, sorry. But, uh, so I hope this question makes sense. You said earlier on that you felt that writers, maybe from the Arab world, are thought of as bringing news mm. to, um, mm. to the rest of the world, as opposed to other writers, maybe Western writers, that's what I understood, who deal with human values. That reminded me of something that a professor here said, who I hope is not here now, in case I misquote her, it's um, Gartu Spivak. She once said in a class I took with her that um, third world writers, quote unquote, are viewed at, as, they're, they're read sociologically, as opposed to for their literary talents. And something that really stuck with me. But I was interested in the social and historical processes of this year, in which the Arab sp Spring, quote unquote, which is obviously the Arab year, maybe going to be the Arab decade or the Arab century, we're still waiting to see, uh, has spawned the Occupy Wall Street movement in this country and other protests around the world. So in a sense, that's, you know, this, this part of the world is learning from another part of the world about democracy, something that this part of the world thinks it, it owns. So I was interested if you could reflect a little bit on that, if you agree with that, if you think there is a relationship between what's happened in uh, Tunisia, Egypt, uh, Libya, and what's happening here. I mean, in a sense, they, there's a return to this issue. Yeah. Since you described the process of writing for you as being situated in a certain reality, you don't want to prescribe it, you don't want to dictate in writing, but you described it as being in that reality and then writing from there and being true to yourself. The question that, in a sense, is returned to is what would you do when that reality has been substantially transformed yeah. in recent years? Yeah. Right? Could you speculate on what that could mean aesthetically for you creatively? Right? I don't. And I think if I, if I could describe it, I wouldn't do it. You know, in the sense that in... in all of the answers are in the writing for me. That um, um, maybe, maybe if I tell you this uh, funny story, it might uh, illustrate what I mean. But I, uh, recently, I had um, I had something that had never happened to me before. I had a whole book, 
like a gift. Just one day, I had a whole book. We were having lunch uh, somewhere in France, and over that lunch, I suddenly had this whole book. And as the day went on, that feeling continued, and I was scribbling and writing. Uh, could hardly sleep from excitement. Didn't say a word to anyone. Uh, early in the morning, I woke up, and I had the whole shape. I knew how many chapters. I knew roughly how many pages or how many words it's going to take to write this book. And it was a very exciting book. <laughs> it was a really good, it sounded like a great book. <laughs> and um, I couldn't wait for my wife to wake up. I woke her up at about 6.30 in the morning. And I told her. I couldn't, I couldn't keep it to myself <laughs> any longer. I told her. about it. She thought it was a great book. <laughs> we had breakfast. We talked about the book. We went for a walk. We talked about the book. By lunchtime, I was completely bored with the book. <laughs> I couldn't see what is the point in writing a book that I knew. In other words, writing is, is writing. It's not, um, um, it's not uh, transcribing. Uh, uh, it's a process of, of, of discovery for me. And, um, and knowing what's going to happen puts me off. And that, I know that's not the directly what you're asking, but in a way it is um, related. That um, um, I might very well, also because we have to remember that novels respond very slowly. You know, I might uh, write something that has absolutely nothing to do with it. And that's sort of the, ab the state of absolute freedom that I was trying to describe. You know, that, that any obligation is, um, in many ways, writers actually don't need a lot. A lot of li Libyan uh, uh, people who want to do work in, in um, civic society, well-meaning, you know, um, in, in Libya and so on, keep asking, what do writers need? You know? When you can ask a very interesting question. Mm. What do writers need? Um, and I think w one of the answers has to be to be left alone. You know, that... Um, Sorry. It's like this, uh, no, no, no. But it's like, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's like this plant, you know, you just clean, all you have to just clean around it, give it enough water and leave it. It's enough sun and fresh air. To, um, and so I, I think more interestingly than speculating about my own work, speculating about Libyan writing, mm -hmm. um, what I hope for it and what I think it's, it's going, going to happen. And it's started to happen already, actually. Uh, because the short story is the favorite form in Libya. Um, uh, rather than even poetry, which is more what you'd expect. Um, and so th w we've had some short stories since and during the revolution. And one of the things, the very new things that is happening is calling things by, by their name. Mm -hmm. And none of this abstract, you know, coded writing, this, the wheel stands for a symbol of the state and the car is a symbol of, you know, all of yeah. this stuff where you need a handbook in order to figure out what's going on. Um, that's beginning to end. Mm. And in a way, it's, it feels like what has happened psychologically in Libya, which is a sort of return to sanity. Mm -hmm. That part of the terrible thing about living under this regime is the day-to-day -day reality. That extraordinary uh, actions and crimes are perpetrated and somehow the focus shifts to something else. It's as if it never happened. Nobody speaks about it anymore, and it moves on. Um, incredibly detailed demands are you know, imposed on the people, and then new set of demands that contradict those demands are introduced, and no one speaks. No one has to explain, sorry, we have decided this is not working anymore. So we want to be like Cuba, OK. And then, no, we want to be like Dubai. There's no explanation. Why do you now want to be like Dubai? No? Mm -hmm. So that's just as an, so that sort of state of vulnerability and anxiety, but also a state of madness, has reflected on Libyan writing, mm -hmm. <laughs> and we've produced a lot of short stories that are sort of mad, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and novels that are mad, um, um, that are um, restricted by by fear and and anxiety, and um, and it is no, it's, it's perfectly reasonable. It's unreasonable to write. Uh, a novel like In the Country of Men if you live in Libya. It's completely unreasonable. It's a mad act, no? Um, so I had a freedom not only writing in another language but being outside. Mm -hmm. So I had relative safety by comparison to the people inside. But now, um,
people want to write about these things and they want to talk about them. Mm. Uh, because some of the things people didn't talk about had to do with uh, fear. Some of the things had to do with shame. That there were moments in the history of the Qaddafi regime where, where Libya sort of underwent a, a kind of national psychosis. Mm. It's shameful, mm -hmm. you know. And, um, uh, and people didn't want to talk about that. Um, and there are other subjects now that people aren't so excited to talk about, but they're being talked about, such as the rape that has happened during mm -hmm. the... Um, rape is a very shameful thing in Libya, and people are very awkward about talking about it. And there's been a lot of very interesting committees and events mm. talking about how to talk about rape, you know? Um, and they've been promoted. And, and so there's a, and, 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 and what I suppose I'm trying to say is that there's a, a new environment of openness and wanting mm. to take stock and interested in testimony, uh, which we, what we haven't been interested in before, where we feared it, we, we didn't know what to do with it. So whenever, you know, the classic example is when Libyans get together and one of them starts to tell the story of their own problems, everybody says, you know, stop whining, you know, do you think you're so special? You have to, they all have the same story, but you know, why, why are you stealing the light? Let's talk about football or something. Yeah. So the whole idea of talking about it is a, is a problem regarding to be self-indulgent. So the return of the testimony is, I think, a very interesting hmm. event. Um, yeah. yeah, I, I can hear. Yeah. The section where you, uh, you read about the mother going to the security agent and kind of begging for mercy and uh, uh, some help, asking for help. Um, this. This this part of this section is makes me very angry, uh, uh -huh. and it's actually infuriating. And uh -huh. many parts of the novel makes me feel that way. And uh, uh -huh. uh, I wonder what you think or feel in these um, situations, because um, I think many Arabs would connect with that mm. with that situation mm. where you're mm. going to a security agent who is, uh, in my mind kind of a person who's immoral and intellectually mm. inferior to you and all the negative things that we associate with mm. them. And these are the people who controlled our lives for yeah. years. Yeah. And, um, um, and and I, I, th I think uh, every Arab who reads that book immediately connects with that fear and, and anger and, and uh, humiliation. Uh, I mean, the best word in Arabic is dhil. I yeah. don't know what it is yeah. in English. Yeah. Um, that every Arab lived for years. Mm. And I think the anger that is coming out is a result of that. So that this book is just kind of so good in portraying that, what people felt for years and, yeah. and the reaction to it. But I wonder how, because y the way you describe your writing as if you're distant from it, but I, do, do you feel angry? Do you feel like when you write these things? Or? That's such an interesting question, you know, when I, it, and it also, it somehow uh, echoes some of the things w we were talking about earlier about um, being in control of the writing and so on. Um, I didn't think I was angry, but as I was writing, I realized there's a great deal of anger in this book. Um, um, and uh, humiliation is, is one of the most powerful effects of this kind of political reality, but also the one that you can't quite measure. You know, you can measure all the other things, number of people in prison, the number of whatever, you know, but you can't measure, how do you measure humiliation? And, um, um, and I, um, you know, I, I had a joke with some of my li Libyan friends how Gaddafi has all of these names, you know, the guide, the, the <laughs> brother leader, the great father, and so one of my personal names for him is the great molester, you know? that there is something about his rule that is about almost uh, humiliating people sexually, you know. Uh, that there is um, there's a process of castration going on, <laughs> you know, in his, in, his, in his logic, in his political logic, um, which somehow then played itself out in the most macabre and horrendous way when he was captured. I could see a link between that for me. I could see a connection. Um, um, and so, um, so yes, no. I, it's uh, am I angry? Um, I don't think of myself as an <laughs> angry person, but, 
but um, I think these things come out. Not, that's what I mean. That 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 when when you see that stuff on the page, for me, is very interesting. And I don't want to get between me and it. You know, mm -hmm. I trust that. You know, if I am an awful person, then my books are going to, or if, or if my concerns are about you know this or that. You know, in the sense that I don't want to govern it. Um, I want to be. Uh, that's what I mean by vulnerable. I want to be as vulnerable as possible with it. Uh, but speaking personally, not as a writer, uh, there was a moment in my life when anger completely um, 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 uh, you know, um, captured me uh, in, my, in, my, in my 20s. Uh, in my late 20s, I was so fuming. <laughs> you could see smoke <laughs> coming out of me. Um, and uh, I felt a deep sense of hate. There's something incredibly warm about hate, absolute hate. It's almost attractive. It seems um, to, it, it tricks you into thinking that it is a very powerful, productive emotion. And it is a young man's emotion, hate and anger. They're a young man's emotions. And, um, and, but I, it was interesting to realize then, and I, the only way I could realize it is when they complete, they put me in a situation where I could no longer ca carry on, you know. Um, and uh, it was interesting then to realize that uh, suddenly I discovered a very simple fact, but to me it was an incredible revelation, <laughs> that they were asking me to build absolutely nothing, to do nothing uh, as a citizen or as a human being. Now as an artist, those things have a different reverberation. They have different functions. Hate and anger, uh, maybe not hate, but anger. I don't think you can write out of hate, um, actually. Um, I do think, in other words, writing is an act of love. It's, it always has to be an, an expression of love, even towards the <laughs> even towards the most despicable. You can't write it well without being in love with these people, on some level, I think, or not suggesting I'm writing it well, but at least attempting to. So, um, so, um, so, yeah, that's just on a personal level. This is a very different kind of question, but I do think it perhaps touches on this question of uh, the, if you like, the very deep and rather very personal and spontaneous origins of creative writing and the necessary distance that at the same time writing requires. And I, this goes back to a remark I once heard you say, and I'd love you to say something more about it, and I may have misremembered it. But you, someone, uh, you were talking about writing in English as the language, your preferred language to write in. And one of the explanations, or one of the things you said, I think, is that it gave, because it's not exactly, uh, I, I'm not sure whether it was your original mother tongue, but anyway, it, that it required from you a certain kind of distance. You had, that, that there was a kind of gap, to it, if you like. So it wasn't as though this, novel that you wrote in a day, in a yeah. lunch, over a yeah. lunch and, and a night time, um, that, that, that the writing that was going to become your real novels um, gave you a certain, perhaps the word is control. I'm not actually sure what you were, so that, yeah, so no, that's I, my question. Uh, English is not my, my mother tongue. Um, and I, it, it, it can, remains a problem for me that I'm not writing in Arabic. It's, not, it's, still, a, it's still a problem. Um, um, but um, I think one of the right, you, I think what you're referring to is that one, one of the reasons that I write in English is that it does allow me a kind of um, distance and a sort of um, channel through which I have to uh, configure what it is that I want to say and uh, in a sentence or in a scene or in a character. Um, and something about this channel has allowed me to uh, write um, with less heat. Um, mm. Returning to this issue about how, you know, it seems to me that one of the most radical things you can do as a Libyan uh, living under the previous reality uh, is to be calm is to be as eloquent and as precise uh, as possible to the facts. Um, and, um, or equally, I think also an incredible act of resistance would be to cook a fantastic meal or, or to make love uh, 
beautifully or whatever, you know, all of these things that, so in, in a sense to me, uh, English has allowed me a, a, a distance that, that has made me closer to that, that I could write calmly and, and more uh, precisely. Um, you know, maybe if I were a different sort of man, I'd be able to do that in Arabic. I know, th I know there are people that that can. It's possible, but for me, that this is what uh, this is what I'm doing now. <laughs> is there? It's, it's getting late. I don't want to keep you guys. But I, I just have just a question about. Um, um, I remember you, I, I heard you say in another uh, discussion that the, this novel began as a poem, uh, or that the feeling mm. that you had um, that eventually became the novel mm. began as a poem. Mm. And I was also interested in um, your interest in silence, because you had said that the, um, uh, the, the pressure of um, political reality in, 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 in Libya m meant there's a lot of pressure of silence, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but when you spoke of the um, the first sentence of your novel, the way that you could hear the silence of the character, mm -hmm. um, and that seemed a much more open silence as mm -hmm. opposed to a closed mm -hmm. silence. Yeah. And um, so I, I was just wondering whether, I was thinking that such a beautiful first sentence in your novel, um, what, what would the difference be if that were in a poem as opposed to, or say in lines, as opposed to in a paragraph, is there something about the paragraph, the form of it, that mm. um, mm. Uh, um, gives you a sense of stability or openness or, yeah. or room for different kinds of silence? Yeah. It's similar how I feel my guilt towards not writing in Arabic, I feel it towards poetry, because I started out as a poet. and um, um, But I don't actually feel that guilty, because I think I, I, what interested me in poetry is sort of, I don't feel I miss it, I mean, I feel guilt, guilt is okay, I feel guilty, but I, I, I miss <laughs> it, I don't miss it, and I don't miss writing it, because uh, I think I'm still um, trying to do it in, in, in writing prose. Um, and in The Country of Men did start as a poem, uh, and it was at a period when most of the poems I was trying to write were all narrative poems, trying to tell a story, and that wasn't the case before. So I could see this shift towards a desire to tell a story. Um, and it's a poem uh, about a boy picking mulberries, which is about 40 pages into the novel now. Um, and I thought it was a, a poem about a, you know, the boy in the garden. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, but then you know, I could hear his voice, and I, I, I thought there's m it, 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 was, it felt Restricted and it wasn't its its form, or maybe you know I still think if I were a good enough poet, I probably would have written this book in a in one poem. Um, but um, but it it seemed that it needed something else. Um, silence is for me is is one of the it's it paradoxical, but it's one of the reasons why I like writing. Uh, it's one of the reasons I write is because I'm interested in silence. Um, uh, from a very young age, I've been interested in music and um, and music treats and uses silence in a way that is very um, structured and um, formal. So it's written. The silences are written. Um, in prose, the silences are written if you call punctuation that, but that's not the sort of silence I mean. I mean not the silence, so the, whereas in music the silence sometimes hovers, but it's usually kind of uh, positioned uh, uh, between the sounds. In prose, it seems to me silence is doing something very interesting. It's sort of hovering above or below or beside. Um, so even you know when we are reading a novel, as we are reading it, we are attuned to a particular. It has a different quality of silence than another writer, or another, or even the same writer, different books, or, or even different passages in the book. And then there is this other sense of the silence between the chapters, and the, par the the paragraphs, and then there is that a different sort of silence when you put the book down, um, which lingers, I think. I do believe that we carry with us the silences of all the books that have meant anything to us. You know, they, that's the way that they linger with us. Um, and so for me, in, in, in as I am starting to, in the very early stages, trying to figure out the voice of the characters, silence is a great guide. Or even the voice of just the, the narrative itself. Silence is a, is, a, is a wonderful guide. When I feel I got the, when I feel I heard 
the authentic silence for this character, then I, I feel I've got 90% of the book. Uh, the other 10% take um, four years to, <laughs> to write. <laughs> Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Is there a, a final question? <laughs> Are you surprised by, as a writer, mm. by how the protagonist just betrays something? Does it surprise him? Does it surprise you? Because mm. mm. uh, it, it was shocking. I was uh, uh, and I didn't expect it. Uh, yeah. It happens two or three different times. Yeah. Um, I think that's part of your. I suppose that. Yeah, the the short answer is no. I mean, I'm su when I'm when, when am I surprised? I'm surprised when I write something that I think is better than me, when I write a sentence that I think is better than I, th better than what I think of myself as a writer. That that's a wonderful surprise. But the ultimate surprise is when the book is done. I can't. I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm 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 shocked. <laughs> but but um, but no. I I am on a very uh, you know I've got greasy hands when I'm doing this stuff. You know, uh, and so all I'm thinking about is, um, does this sound right? You know, like like the mechanic in the belly of the ship. You know, I'm just making sure things are running smoothly and it's. Uh, and sometimes in situations like this, I feel like I'm being asked, you know, somebody from the upper deck came down in their clean linens and saying, so do you think, how do you like the landscape? How do you like <laughs> the scenery out there? <laughs> so I'm just trying to make this thing work. <laughs> um, I think we'll end with this. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you, Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.